What I really wanted to talk about uh, in, in this paper was about the different ways that spatiality and space are manifested in ambient music. Uh, and I wanted to do it primarily in the context of the first wave of, of ambient musicians uh, who are back in the call of uh, ambient BC because it's ambient before chillouts. Uh, and I'm going to particularly focus on Brian Eno's album uh, on land for two reasons. Firstly, I think it lays out a new set of possibilities for the way ambient music could be made and understood. And secondly, because it had a huge impact on my life, uh, and actually directly uh, led to me becoming a musician. In fact, it actually led to me living in permanent poverty as a result. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I did think about calling this, uh, this you know, some, something else, but uh, anyway. The first category of space that I want to talk about is listening space. And that's kind of an idea that, that's been around quite a lot, and, and uh, Doyle and Demers and people like that have discussed it. And really their idea of listening space kind of revolves around the spatial characteristics of music and the way those characteristics elicit emotions from the listener. But I, I kind of suggest that you really also need to consider environment when you're talking about so, and music. And I, I think it's, a, it's an important set of interactions where music affects the environment and the listener using their preconceptions, their knowledge, their uh, uh, prejudices, if you like, or whatever, uh, kind of draw different things from that music. They, they understand it through that process. Uh, it's, a, it's basically triangulation. So, listening space is implicit in all listening experiences. And it's something that we are all very sophisticated about manipulating. People have music for driving cars, music for dinner parties. Uh, we all utilise music in different ways to affect our environment. And that's particularly pertinent in ambient music. When you look at the, the sort of exegesis that the Vino put forward, it's quite clearly uh, a music that he intends to use as a form of environmental control. So that's the first one. And I'm racing through these because I want to get to the third one, to be honest. The second manifestation of speciality in ambient music uh, is that it's present in all forms of recorded popular music, and that's the use of spatial effects. And I think that these take two forms, applied effects and embodied effects. And the applied effects are precisely that. They're, the, they're when you've got a guitar part and the guitarist says, but I want to sound as if I'm in a church. And you put a reverb on it and it sounds like it's in a church. But you don't substantially alter the music. There are embodied effects uh, where the, the effect is a constituent part of the music. Where, say, when Robert Fripp sets a tape loop going and plays against it and harmonises with it and builds on top of it, that's, clear, that's an embodied effect. And I think the test is a kind of reductionist thing. If you, if you take away the effect and you're still left with the track, then you've got applied effects. And if you take away the effects and you're left with a big hole in the middle of the track, then you've got embodied effects. So, <clears throat> and obviously embodied effects would include things like Eno's discrete music, which we heard about earlier, which is a whole tape loop, uh, a whole tape loop piece, where it's everything you've built on repeating phrases coming back and sort of disappearing spectrally. There's also another type of embodiment that's kind of present in, in effects that, like, like every musical instrument, like, like every piece of, of, of gear, musical effects have got their own kind of tonal fingerprint. And that tonal fingerprint carries a lot of information with it. So, if you take a Rolling Space Echo, which was made in the 70s and appeared on lots of dub records and, and lots of uh, lots of kind of spatial records like Pink Floyd and things like that. And it has that particular characteristic of slight wobble and it's got lots of frequencies deadening in both ends. That carries that information with us, that it's from that time. We know that, that instantly when we hear that, it's from the 70s. So it's an effect that is carrying a, a, an element of spatialization, but it's also carrying some temporal information as well. And of course, the interesting thing about that is that there are now 
so many replications of that instrument, uh, of that effect. You know, you can get VSTs, you can buy guitar pedals that, that replicate it, uh, and uh, it's it's quite an interesting idea that we're making something old. The third type of space is the area I'm particularly interested in talking about. And it's more specific to the kind of generic conventions of ambient music. It's not part of a mechanical, acoustic, or a technological process. It's really the product of kind of artistic construction. And it's really a point where elements of representation and simulation, they meet to create this, this particular space, figurative space. As ever, when we're talking about ambient music, Eno kind of kicks the, uh, the ball into uh, play and says that, that this, the online was an attempt to transpose into music something that you can do in painting uh, and create a figurative environment. And he talks about, when he's making online, <clears throat> about how, what criteria he uses for including tracks on it. And that they have to uh, take him somewhere, that they have to suggest something, uh, and it may be somewhere that he's imagined going to, or it may be somewhere that he's kind of got some experience of, but he's not necessarily that familiar with. And also, he comes up with this really interesting comment that he says that uh, we feel affinities not only with the past, but also with the futures that didn't materialise and with other variations of the present that we suspect run parallel to the one we've agreed to live in. And that's kind of like, sounds like a kind of proto-ontology manifesto, really. It's, it's, uh, it's everything that those guys are, are talking about quite constantly. We, we've heard from Mark Fisher and, and, the, and the like. But there are problems with it because he doesn't go the same route as the ontologists. He doesn't kind of assimilate the musical conventions and technologies of a past period in order to simulate kind of nostalgia, memory loss, whatever. He goes a completely different route. I mean, if he had gone that route, I guess he would have been adopting doo-wop and the things from his childhood. But it weren't pre-rock and roll even, maybe. But he goes down a route where uh, he's taking a more painterly approach. Instead of taking a musicological approach, he takes a painterly approach. And he says that as he does this, he has less and less use for instruments. He shifts to a process that starts with regular instruments and gradually goes towards acoustic instruments and ends up with non-instruments pieces of chain, and sticks, and stone. And that means, well, why is ambient music such an effective, effective vehicle? Excuse me, I've just got to have a drink. <clears throat> so, why is ambient music such an effective vehicle for constructing space? Because place is frequently present in all popular music. Well, we take an example, we've got Kink's Waterloo Sunset. And on the surface, that's a song that's got beautifully captures a sense of place, there's nostalgia, there's yearning. But in Waterloo Sunset, place only acts as a backdrop for the singer and, and the singer's concerns. We don't connect with that, we, we connect through the singer, we're actually removed. Uh, it's context, and we can only experience it through that singer's uh, persona. The singer's always going to demand our attention. They're always going to distract us from the backdrop. And as Eno noticed, you know, uh, as Eno said to me, take a landscape, as soon as it's a human subject, however tiny, it captures all the attention. So, the strategy of ambient music, of, of removing itself from the foreground and shedding the focal point of the singer, which is perhaps more important, uh, it leaves us with a different audio topography. And this is one in which that landscape becomes absorbed into the genre's expressive vocabulary. 
And the ultimate conclusion of that process might be that musicians are kind of using an audio landscape uh, of, of background music to create <coughs> sonic landscapes representing real landscapes or imagined landscapes. The methodology that we're trying to uh, use to commit uh, to construct picture space in, in any music draws on a number of elements associated with representational art. And that's quite a complicated argument, you know, it's hotly contested about whether music can be representational. We've got people like Scruton and, and Coons and uh, Goodman all, all arguing about whether this is a, 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 something we can actually accept. But I think what we can acknowledge is that certainly some characteristics that are considered essential for representational art are strongly present in ambient music. So the obvious one being the track title, telling us what the, uh, what, what the piece is about, it's so explaining what the piece is about. Uh, the fact that the track and the subject are separate entities, well, yes. Uh, and that ambient music often features representation sonically of place in terms of field recordings or simulations of sound that are present in place or, or, or whatever. And simulation is also tied into that and it plays an important role in the way that, uh, that figurative space is manufactured. In 2009, my band uh, made an album inspired by Tokyo, but neither of us had actually ever been to Tokyo. We made it sure, completely based on our received images through media, film, TV, books. And that kind of is reminiscent of Eco's idea that, that uh, uh, we're living in an age where uh, where reality is eroded by the media and that we can't recognise the difference. Uh, and it seems real is real and the thing is real if, like Alison Mundland, it never even existed. It also suggests quite strongly that authenticity is not an essential part of uh, figurative space. And I think we can see that because there's countless ambient records that are about space and other planets and uh, the cosmos, and I think we can be confident that the people who made those records weren't uh, familiar with those places. Uh, but uh, we, we, it doesn't matter because we accept it, because we share the same preconceptions, we share uh, the simulation as reality. And simulation also occurs as a sonic component. Anyone that's listened to a selection of ambient music would be familiar with the uh, ubiquitous synthetic cicadas, which were a really big hit in the 80s and put on dozens of records. Uh, we've got other greatest hits of ambient music. We've got birdsong, thunder, wind noise. New Age music's got the uh, Amazon rainforest sounds. Uh, New Age uh, also has breaking waves and <coughs> the perpetually babbling stream. Yeah. And they're kind of easy to make these sounds and, and uh, if you can't make them, you can whip them off a sound library quite quickly. But they're still extremely effective in creating a sense of location. And they work because we all decode them, we all understand them. And, you know, away we go. So, I was thinking about transmission and reception and how we interpret records that represent place. So, when Eno makes Lantern Marsh, how do we understand it? Well, we know it's construction of a place, but it's an artistic construction of a place. And that that place is, situ is situated at, at a junction of knowledge, temporality, imagination. Eno's creating a possible version of his own past and a geography that may or may not have existed. It could be about the place on the map, or it could be about somewhere else entirely. You know, it could be like my version of Tokyo, it's just in his imagination. It might just be a metaphor for memory and loss of possible futures, or even just a name that he applied to a piece of music that he liked. And how does this affect the listener? 
Are they engaging with the depiction of Eno's memory, which they couldn't possibly have experienced, especially if it's not even clear that Eno experienced it? Or is it just a vehicle for them to project their own experiences and memories onto it? And for some listeners, it will also become a soundtrack to their own memories and become part of their own personal history, uh, like it has for me, of illustrating places and events which they've experienced and which Brian Eno will be completely unaware of it. So I think we have to have a slight note of caution with figurative space that the idea that all figurative space is representational, because we can't assume that all tracks which appear to be representational were necessarily created with a specific subject in mind. And often artists will complete a track and only then decide what it's about, give it a title. And I think at that point you have an interesting moment because the artist almost kind of steps out of himself and becomes a listener. They, they're then hearing it and thinking, well, what is it? What have I made? What have I done? And they give it that title. So, to sum up, ambient music's re repositioning away from the foreground ensures that there's a, a dynamic interpretive relationship between the listener, the artist, and the text. Spatiality occurs in different forms. We have listening space, we've got the audio spatiality generated by effects. Uh, and we've got the figurative space in which things like memory, loss, and imagination are interlinked. And on a final note, in the case of on land, those figurative spaces that revolve around a temporal disjunction in which Eno apparently seeks to recreate a vision of his past uh, and futures that didn't materialise, it's now 36 years since he made that record, and that exploration of temporality, mood and concern, are still big questions that people are asking. There's still uh, things that are exciting a lot of people at the cutting edge of new music, uh, you know, untold people and, and, and vaporwave artists as well. And I also think that, like, for, for me, on a final note, I wonder if how we, we consider on land, because Eno's meditation on kind of lost pasts and futures is receding further into the past itself. It's now older than Eno was when he made it. And I'm aware, for me, that that's something that has also slipped into my past. And my relationship with it changes as things change in my life, and I think, well, they emanate from that. So, uh, for me, it's been quite a long journey with online. So, I Leave it there.